This guy, Danny Edwards, he concocted this plan to kidnap Stephen Small. So I moved to Kankakee, I think, in January of 1986. I was in my second term or second half of my sixth grade year. And then I moved out of Kankakee to Swansea in September of 1988. When I lived there, obviously, I thought it was, it was nice. I had a paper route. I definitely went to some dangerous areas. Kankakee was at one point voted the worst place to raise a family. I, I lived in a really affluent area. I had a bunch of friends right in the same area, Chris Ruder, who started Spike Ball. And then uh, neighbors that were across the street, or across the alley, were Chris and Barry Small and Ramsey Small, and their father was Stephen Small. And then my very direct neighbor next door was um, Lieutenant Governor George Ryan. Um, Chris and Barry, they came, they, you know, their father was a multimillionaire, so they didn't, they didn't, um, their reality was a lot different than mine. Like I'd wake up and mow the lawn, you know, someone would be mowing their lawn. But this guy, Danny Edwards, he was a drug dealer and he had got pinched. So basically, um, as part of the plea deal, he was given the opportunity to, um, rat out basically the next guy up. And so part of that plea deal is he went, he went to do that, but the guy caught on to it and knew what he was doing and didn't, didn't fall for it. Well, at that point, part of that plea deal was if he ever did anything else that he would be prosecuted for that, like in the drug, like if he ever, you know, sold drugs again, and got caught doing that, he would go to jail for, you know, who knows how much time. Um, so basically he concocted this plan to kidnap Stephen Small. And that, um, Danny did well enough that like he had a house on his own in the drug business. He did well enough. He had a house on his own out in the Roma Park and Nancy um, and her son, he rented them a house or a townhouse in, in Bourbon A, which was kind of a part of Kankakee, just on the outside of Kankakee. So she knew what he did for a living. She knew that he was in the drug business. She knew, um, she knew that like he wasn't the greatest guy, um, but she was young and that's all she thought it was, was like he was a drug dealer. And then she knew all the information where he got caught dealing drugs and everything like that, but he was not the nicest guy. So he would tell her to mind your business, you know, uh, don't ask questions. And, and she didn't. The, the story goes, they, and, and this was all based on the fact that the Kankakee police interrogated her and got all this information. This is how we know all that happened. And then as the, the, the investigation went on, a lot of the people who, who were witnesses to things that happened actually corroborated what she said. So she ended up following him. He had a van. She followed him to the neighborhood. She drove her car. He drove the van, followed her to the neighborhood. He got out. He pulled a duffel bag out of his van. He got into her car. He put the duffel bag in the back seat. They drive um, over to a gas station near Yonakis, which I would guess is probably like a mile away in that range, between half a mile and a mile away. The, the gas station they pulled up to had a payphone that you could literally pull right up to in your car because it, Illinois was cold. Sometimes you didn't want to get out of your car. You would pull up to the payphone, it was short, and you would actually pull it into your, your car and you would talk right from there. But she, she pulled, you know, 10 feet away and he went and called and made the, the phone call to the house as if he was the Kankakee police. That was the original call to get him, to get Stephen Small out of the house. He gets in the car, he tells her to drive the Cobb car, Cobb Park. Cobb Park was literally at the end of my block, right? So they pulled to the end of Cobb, they went to Cobb Park. He gets out of the car, now he takes the duffel bag out, shuts the door, runs up the alley. 
he gets to, now we didn't know this because we always thought, like I said before, that, that they met them at the place of business, but he ran up to the garage. He waited when the garage door opened and the car started to back out. It was a Mercedes Benz started to back out. He jumped in the passenger seat with a gun. He drove them out. He drove uh, Stephen Small out to a location at some point and actually pulled over, had Stephen Small pull over and put him in a, in a, um, in the trunk. I think because he didn't want him to know where he actually um, put him in the box because he didn't want the police to be able to ever go back out there and find the evidence. I think he was gonna do everything in reverse. So he drives him to the location, makes him record a message to his wife. He puts him in this box and then he buries the box. Now the box has the pipe up to the ground. He then goes to a location um, that he had predetermined with Nancy, which is at like a railroad track that was, you know, a five minute walk or a five minute jog away from where he actually buried Stephen Small in this box. She picked him up from that location and drove him back to his van. They got, he got his van, they went back to the house. At that point, he left the house, went and made the first ransom phone call. And that's when Nancy Ram. picked up the phone and that's the first ransom phone call. He goes back home the next morning. Um, they go around, they do, they, they, you know, I think she takes her son to football practice. She goes, she kind of goes about her life, right? And now he's planning all this, all this different stuff. Um, ultimately, he, at some point, remembered that he left bolt cutters. He had handcuffed Stephen Small. He left bolt cutters at the scene. So he had told Nancy, like, let's take a ride. And they went out to Aroma Park and he dropped, she dropped him at a horse farm and then went to visit her sister. Well, from that horse farm or horse ranch, he went out and actually looked for the bolt cutters and never found them. Eventually the police found them. But at that point, I think he had yelled through the pipe and got no response. And he realized that Stephen Small was dead.